Here we are at the second last section of the chapter, and it really is one of the most important ones of this entire chapter. Three things on this slide. The first one says, mathematically, there are four cases to consider. What do I mean by that? I'm talking about the signs of delta H and delta S. We could have a negative, positive, a positive, negative, a negative, negative, or a positive, positive. Those signs will influence what is the sign of delta G. We'll take a look at the first one, which has a negative delta H and a positive delta S. If I put those two into the delta G equation, we will get a negative delta G, and that is why we say this will be spontaneous at any temperature. I'm gonna let you work out the second one because you have to see for yourself how does this really work. The examples that we're going to do in this section will help you see what we mean by a defined temperature. The third thing on this slide, I just copied it out of the textbook. I don't know how you're studying at this point, but there should be a correlation between the two. On the second slide, I want you to realize something about the outcome. Here we have a negative delta G. Here we have a positive delta G. I'm looking at the exact same equation. In the first equation, I have SO2 and O2 as reactants. In the second equation, I have SO2 and O2 as the products. It is an identical equation. Just like when we were in chapter five, when we reverse the direction of a reaction, we had to change the sign. The same thing is happening here. So let's go back to this first one where we have this negative delta G. It says the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction. So we have that in mind. When we go and look at the second example, what we see is it has the same magnitude, but it has a different sign. That positive sign says it's now spontaneous in the reverse direction. No matter how we write this equation, we still have the same outcome. We will always see SO2 and O2 going to form SO3 favored by a negative delta G. That is the spontaneous direction of the reaction. So that's one big point from this section. The other one says, keep in mind, even if we have a negative delta G, it may occur too slowly to actually be observed. Normally I have a jar of ethanol on the bench when I give the lecture and I say, this has a negative delta G, the decomposition to the elements, but we would never see it occur. It is just too slow for us to observe it. The other thing is spontaneity, a delta G, really tells us about the direction of a spontaneous process. No, it has nothing at all to do with the rate of a reaction. A lot of heavy duty things here. We had kinetics with rules, equilibrium with rules. Now we have free energy with rules. To wrap this section up, let's just do a calculation or two to illustrate what needs to be learned. Here it says, what is the delta G at 500 degrees centigrade? We are given a delta H, we are given a delta S. And so if we want the delta G zero at 500 degrees centigrade, we will assume the delta H and delta S do not change. So we will say minus 198.4 kilojoules, and we will subtract from that the temperature, which is 773 Kelvin, and we will multiply it by the entropy in terms of kilojoules. 0 0.1879 kilojoules per Kelvin. When I crunch my number through, I come up with a value of minus 53.2 kilojoules per mole. So notice, I have different values for delta G. When I am at 500 degrees centigrade, it has a value of minus 53. When I am at 25 degrees centigrade, I have a value of minus 249. If you look back at the first slide, we said 
spontaneity will change at a certain temperature. How can we figure out what that temperature is? Well, we will set the delta G zero equal to zero and we will solve for temperature. So we would have T delta S is equal to delta H or T is delta H divided by delta S. Such an easy calculation compared to a lot of other things we've done. So I would just say my temperature where it will change will be my delta H, my minus 198.4 kilojoules. I will divide that by my delta S and I need to put that in terms of kilojoules. 0.1879 kilojoules per Kelvin, and I come up with 1056 Kelvin. We normally put it in terms of degrees centigrade. So there's our numerical answer. But what does that tell us? It says, if I am below 782 degrees centigrade, the reaction as written is spontaneous. If I am above 782 degrees centigrade, the reaction is non-spontaneous. So this can be applied to anything, and it often is a question on a midterm exam because we want to see, can you figure out what temperature spontaneity changes? For the problem we just did, we saw at 25 degrees centigrade, it was minus 249. That was the data given. At 500 degrees centigrade, we saw it was minus 53. So it was really working its way towards the number where spontaneity would actually change. Okay, one or two more to say. You can even use thermodynamics to estimate a boiling point, and they often put this on professional exams because it says, do you remember the free energy equation? Do you remember how to calculate a temperature change? And what really the reaction is, if we're looking at the boiling point of bromine, it's going from a liquid to the gas phase. This would either be given or if you're doing your homework, you need to look it up. But the best part is it's such a simple calculation. T is equal to our delta H zero, 30.91 kilojoules, and delta S will be 0 0.0932 kilojoules per Kelvin. That will give us a temperature of Kelvin of 331.6 Kelvin, and that is 59 degrees centigrade. Now, you know I really like chemistry, so this is where I get really excited. Because if I go in the lab and I measure the actual boiling point, it is gonna be 58.78 degrees centigrade. So what it shows is that we have things we see in the lab, and with the field of thermodynamics, they are able to mathematically, theoretically, Describe what's happening in real life. Okay, two more slides. This one, I hope the bio people are going to like this. These are two real life examples. Glucose is oxidized in our body tissue. You notice here the delta G is a negative, and so that reaction is spontaneous as written. It's actually end of chapter homework problem 19.99. The second example I have really is even better. It says the synthesis of glucose 6-phosphate is the first step in the metabolism of glucose in many organisms. So what I did is I wrote down the equation for glucose plus plus phosphate to give me glucose 6-phosphate, and it has a positive delta G. If you couple that with the conversion of ATP going to form ADP plus that phosphate group, what we have is a negative delta G. Just like we've taught in all the chapters, you can add equations together, and essentially what you're getting rid of is the things that appear on both sides, which would be the P1 and the water. We come up with a chemical equation that converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, and looking at the free energy values, we see that it is negative, and that means the reaction will proceed as written spontaneously. 
The last slide also is another example. When I worked for British Petroleum, for those of you keeping track of when I say that, you can make a little point on your bingo card. We wanted to take copper out of the ground at Kennecott out west. And so copper exists as a sulfide. There it is, the solid, and what we wanted to do is sell the copper to make copper wire. The delta G for this reaction had a positive value. Therefore, it was not going to go spontaneously in the forward direction. So what we did, or really it was my friend Alcus Rappus, he was the engineer on the project, he said, let's add oxygen to the process. If we had oxygen to the process, we, yes, will make SO2, but look at this delta G value. It gives us a delta G of a negative sign, meaning it is spontaneous in the forward direction. So that looks really good on paper, but what happens to SO2 in the presence of water or even air? What happens is SO2 goes to form SO3, which goes to form H2SO4, which is acid rain. So this is where I am so sad we do not get to do more real life chemistry in our class because I think it would help you better understand a lot of the things we have to say. As usual, we're at the end of this section. Please do the homework. Please send me some emails so I can make a little video to explain things that you do not understand.